Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. You caught me looking at my watch there. It's 10 o'clock in the morning, and it is our nexus specifically for the Cape Town Metro, Atlantic Seaboard, Northern and Southern Suburbs, and South Peninsula area. In partnership with APSA, I'd like to say good morning to you. Good morning, Kobe. Good morning, Eunice Rodriguez, Eliza, or Elise Leroux. Thank you so much for joining us from Expello. Good morning, Lynette. And thank you for letting us know that you're from Rawson, Milneton. Hello, hello, hello. Goeiemore, your head. I'm very happy to have you with us yet again. Morning, Mohammed. If you can see me, let me have a quick hello. Drop an emoji. Let me see. Good morning, your head. Thank you. You're always like the first one out of the, the mark there. Good morning, Burton. Anna Marie, good morning. Good morning, Kim Miller. We already have 71 people on this call. This is going to be one of our biggest nexus yet. So we're really, really looking forward to uh, having the session with you today. Good morning from Durbanville in Cape Town. Huyamora, Julian. Morning, Feline. Thank you for saying my whole name. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, Jan. Good to have you back with us. Good morning, Nerissa. Huyamora, huyamora, huyamora. I think let us give ourselves a minute or so and let everyone settle in. Good morning, Gemma. I see you there. Good morning, Hendrina. Good morning, Henry. Good morning, Vilma. Good morning, Leticia. Cameron, good morning. And then Lynette, good morning from Beach Road Properties in Malpostrand. I love that. that. I just love everything about the Western Cape. I love everything about Cape Town. I'm actually from Cape Town, so I'm a little bit biased. Good morning, Jennifer. Good morning, Jill. Good morning, Leslie. Is anyone here from the rest of the country? Because, you know, with good morning, Deirdre, with the internet, we're able to connect from wherever. On our first Nexus on Monday, we actually had somebody connecting all the way from the UK. Uh, good morning, Janine Panika. Good morning, Sidri. Nice to see you. Good morning, Natasha. All right. I think that's about a minute in, so let me do my greeting and let's get the show on the road. Of course, today is a really, really special day for us here at Private Property, and when I get to the part where I explain what these buttons on the side here do, then I'm going to pop in a question there for you. And I'm going to ask you if you know why today is like super for us here at Private Property. So my name is Tracy Lee Miller and I'm the brand and marketing executive here at Private Property. And I'm going to be your virtual host for this morning's session. The word nexus means a series of connections that link two or more things or ideas, and that is exactly what these nexus events are all about. It's a series of digital networking events which cultivate human connection through knowledge sharing and networking. Our first nexus was hosted last year in November, and it was incredibly well received by the industry. So we decided we're going to bring it back, but we're going to do it differently. We're going to focus on specific regions and bring insights that are specifically relevant to those regions. So they are hyper relevant to you in your area, giving you the best possible chance of su achieving success even in this tough, tough market. Have you been part of the Nexus series? We started on Monday, tomorrow's our last Nexus. And I'm telling you now, we've had so much fun. I don't think we're going to uh, stop doing these connection series. I'd like to also thank our partners, APSA, and also PayProp, because they are part of our speaker lineup today and because they can see the power of partnership and the power of connection. So before we get started, I want to take you through the environment, this platform that we are on. It's a very simple platform and it's built for engagement. It's built for us to be able to engage with each other. So right here on the right of your screen, you'll see the chat, the, the word chat. And in that chat, I'm going to ask you to drop an emoji that represents how you feel right at this minute. I'm going to drop a heart that is green because obviously um, my heart is green. So please, if you can, thank you, Carl. Thank you, Feline. I see you dropping that emoji. It can be any color. It can be anything. 
It's an emoji that represents how you feel right now. Dion, you feel like a ghost. Yo, Lynette, I like the sunglasses. Someone feels like an alien. Who's that? Louise, like an alien. Ricky, hi. You've got a smiley face. I love that. Thank you, guys. Thank you for keeping the energy up in this room. Just because we can't see each other doesn't mean that we are not connected. We are not connecting through the screen right now. Right next to the chat button, you can see a participants button. If there's someone that asks a question and then you think you may have the answer to that question, or if there's someone that you've been meaning to connect with, or someone who you've had an interest in having a conversation with, you can hang your cursor over the message um, icon there and message that person directly. This is a platform that enables direct communication. So I can even see all the names there in alphabetical order, and it's really built for connection. The button next to it is called is, is, is the Q&A button. And if I click on that Q&A button, here's the, the question I'm going to ask you. Why is today so special for private property? Um, I'm going to ask that question, and I'm not going to ask anonymously. If you ask, it asks whether you want to ask this question anonymously. I'm not. So you'll see my name when I ask that question. Somebody already upvoted that question. Three votes, four votes, five votes, six votes. If I get to 10 votes, then I will give the answer. If you know the answer, go to your chat box and then you tell us what you think it is. Please, private property people do not answer the question because that would be cheating. So once a question is upvoted, all right, I see it's gotten to 11 votes, 12 votes, I will tell you, yes, it's St. Patrick's Day, but it's also the day where we decided, it's on this day that we decided that we are going to change the way we look, the way we are, the way we speak, and the way we think of um, connection. So this is the day that we change from the red, white, and the blue into the green. I'm not going to bore you with too much of that stuff, but for us, I just want to say it is an incredibly exciting day. It's an incredibly rewarding day, and it's a day that literally swells our hearts with pride. So before we get started, I also want you to know that we love in rewarding engagement. So the person who asked the best question, who let's say gets the most upvotes, will stand to win a prize. Or if it's a question that makes us all think and go, wow, I've learned something, just in asking that question, I've learned something, then we will reward that person as well. Also, we do reward people for giving a lot of um, a lot of emojis and questions and, you know, lots of engagement. And so that is someone that we are going to also announce as who, whoever that person is could be the winner. Okay. Um, I see we have another, I have another uh, question here asked anonymously. Mm -hmm. Shall we ask why anonymous looks fantastic, a bit like the other people? It's definitely not like the other people. We are definitely our own green, our own, our own color. All right, let's get cracking. The last thing I want to say to you guys is we have managed to secure one and a half non-verifiable CPD points from AISA. You have to stick around to the session, get the link, register on that link, and you will be able to claim then your points. All right, without further ado, Iona. We are about to start right now. Right. <laughs> okay, I see some interesting comments here from Gregory McDonald. We're going to, uh, we'll touch on that a little bit later when Carl Vandenberg does his conversation or does his talk around uh, what partnership looks like for uh, PP and what we think or where we think the brand, where we're taking this brand in the next couple of years. Without further ado, allow me to please go onto the stage studio, if you can. Bring onto the stage Ms. Caroline King, and she is the head of sales strategy and analytics. Um, she is going to talk to us today about some property market insights and also interesting home loan statistics. Caroline, are you with us? Have you gotten into the limo yet? Oh, Ross, I think Ross, this is our very first gift. Unbelievable. Thank you, Ross Taylor. <laughs> well done. 
Okay, Iona, you're saying I can hear, but no photo. Um, so perhaps restart. One of the important things we need to remember is that Chrome works incredibly well with this platform. If you want to really get the most out of the platform, try and connect using Chrome. But without further ado, Caroline, the beautiful Caroline King is joining us today. Thank you so much. Enjoy the session, folks. Thanks, Trace. Thank you for that warm introduction and good morning to everybody. Good morning the, to the Cape. I'm sitting here in Johannesburg and it was uh, very wet and very raining uh, when I was in here this morning. I believe the sun is shining in Cape Town. So you definitely are having much better weather than we are at the moment. Um, my name is Caroline King. I look after um, strategy, sales and business analytics for APSA Home Loans. Um, and I'd like to thank Private Property, our strategic partners, for once again putting on a very awesome platform um, and allowing us to engage with you guys today. Um, a little bit later, I'm going to um, introduce our uh, regional manager for Western Cape. He's going to join me up on stage um, and we're happy to take any questions that you guys would have. But just before that, maybe let me just share a little bit of thoughts from our perspective around what we're seeing in the property industry. It's always very interesting when I do these talks, though, because I am definitely convinced that all of you on this platform are actually better poised to be giving me insights about the property industry. But let me take a stab and then you guys are welcome to share with me during the networking sessions around what you're seeing specifically in your areas. So the first the first slide that we're going to share is this one, and I think it's becoming all too familiar around um, the mask wearing, um, the slight panic that we possibly all felt um, this time last year, and what a journey the past 12 months really have been. Um, you know, a, a pandemic that not only impacted our property industry, our country, but the whole world at the end of the day. Um, and what we're going to share with you a little bit is what have we seen through the pandemic and what are we starting to see um, at the start of 2021. Um, and I'm sure this pandemic hasn't only just impacted all of us from a business perspective, but personally as well. Um, I'm sure that it's adapted how we're working, how we're living, um, how kids are going to school. Um, and I'm, I'm sure that if we don't know someone directly, we know of someone who has left, lost a loved one. Um, and it's been a very emotional and emotive um, past 12 months as well. And what does this actually mean for the property industry? And let me share with you um, um, some, some numbers. Um, and I promised private property that we would try not to be too much of a bank. So I promise there are not that many graphs um, in here. So what did we see over the past 12 months? I really talk about the past 12 months as a tale of two halves. We had the first half where the first quarter was actually quite booming in the property industry. And then came March with lockdown level five. And all of you guys felt the true impact of that, not only personally, but also from a business context, when the real estate industry effectively was shut down for almost two months of last year. And we can definitely see that when we look at APSA's application volumes, that our application volumes in the first half of the year went down by 9%. But what was the most amazing thing to see is the recovery in the second half of the year. We went down by 9%, and in the Next six months of 2020, we saw growth of 36% in application volumes, which was a phenomenal recovery. I'm going to talk a little bit about what do we think drove the, that recovery. When we look at the registrations that happened in the deeds office, and all of you too, as well as us, were impacted by the closures of deeds offices and the very slow rollback or roll in of the deeds offices across the country, specifically in Cape Town um, as well. But what was very interesting to see when we look back at the tale of two halves is that the second half of last year, the deeds office registered double of what it did in the first half of last year. And again, just showing this tale of, of two halves through the year. The question that we're often posed with from a banking perspective is what does this mean about the quality of customer? Did you see um, uh, the quality of customer start to decrease because we were worried about customers' finances? We actually didn't see that. The quality of customer upheld through the whole of last year. Um, and that was actually what allowed us um, to maintain a very high approval rate um, as we saw the second half of the recovery unfold. Um, and I think that is actually what uh, was some of the main drivers towards the buoyancy of the property market um, and what we started to see, especially you guys from a sales perspective in the property industry. 
What we also look at from an APSA perspective is a proprietary index called the Home Owner Sentiment Index. Um, and this is a proprietary index that we use to tell us, so we actually go and ask customers, what do they see and what do they think about home ownership? And we want to share, we've just got our latest stats, which takes us all the way to um, the end of last year. And we use this quite often to test it's a barometer that we use to test how customers are feeling and what we can predict is going to come in the next quarter with regards to home ownership. And if you look at this graph, this home owner sentiment index all the way up until Q4, what you will see is in Q4 of last year, we had the highest sentiment at 80% of home ownership. This is customers telling us that they believe in home ownership and that what they think of home ownership. And it's the highest it's been, not only through last year, but it's the highest it's been since the inception of this index in 2015. So people think that home ownership is a very good thing. That's really what this index is telling us. We break down this index to four subcategories, and we'll talk a little bit about that um, as we go through. Um, if we can go to the next slide. Thanks, team. Um, so, so what we, what we saw here was the Home Sentiment Index broken by region, and we chose four of the top regions. So you guys would recall that the national average is sitting at 80%. Western Cape is sitting at 79%, so only 1% below the national. You can see that Gauteng is really driving the sentiment at the moment, 1% up from the national, but that is actually where we've seen the most applications come through um, in 2020. What is interesting, though, from a regional perspective, and specifically for Western Cape, is that the 79% is 10% above where it was the previous quarter. So in Q4 of last year, the Western Cape home ownership sentiment increased by 10%, the highest increase across all of the regions. And we have some thoughts around that. We think that this is driven largely by what we call semigration where we see um, some of our customers moving down towards the coast, uh, where they're choosing lifestyle above being in a metro closer to work because work from home is now allowing this. And we think there's some interesting dynamics that are happening specifically in the Western Cape with regards to home ownership and how customers are purchasing their, their, their properties. If we go to the next slide, what we're going to look at is um, the homeowner sentiment index by customer type. And we derive this by um, existing customers, so customers who, have, who ex have an existing home or live in an existing home, as well as our first-time home buyers, our investors, um, as well as the renter. And what's very interesting to see across these sentiments is that um, the, the existing homeowner um, has always lagged the homeowner sentiment. And we think a little bit of that is due to um, a slightly underestimated value that they find once they've gone through the buying and selling, the selling and then buying phase of the property from a cost perspective. Um, and they really spend some time now trying to understand how do they make it their home um, and so on and so forth. But what's interesting is that this is the customer type, existing homeowners who took a dip as you can see in the middle of the quarter, but had the sharpest recovery through last year, all the way back up to, um, to Q4. What you'll see in that dark purple line and that deep V, that is the investor line. And we know that in the heart of lockdown, investors um, possibly had the lowest sentiment um, with regards to home ownership. And this was largely driven by economic circumstances. They didn't want to add additional properties onto their investor portfolio. And also what we started to see in the heart of lockdown was rent to default. And I think this gave a little bit of a cautionary measure towards investors. But we're, we're happy to see that the investors have bounced back through the last quarters um, of last year and um, have returned um, to just slightly higher, the highest that uh, the home sentiment is, just above first-time home buyers. And I'm sure you guys are testimony to this as well, is through the heart of lockdown. It was the first-time home buyers that really was the surge of um, recovery within the market. And we're going to talk a little bit about what the drivers of that surge was from a first-time home buyer perspective. Um, but what was interesting to see is in the heart of lockdown, it was the first-time home buyers. And towards the end of the year, as we can see from this graph, it's the remortgage customers. The customers now buying their second or third home that were a little bit more cautious through the year, but towards the end of the last year, returned back into the market. On the next graph, 
what we're going to see is um, the sentiment of buying versus the sentiment of selling property. And this is really your business um, at the end of the day. And what really is interesting here is to see that the buying sentiment, the top line, um, continued to uptick through the year. And the, se the sell selling sentiment, the bottom line, um, started to increase, but definitely not at the rate at which the buying sentiment increased. And when you look at um, the start, the end of 2019 Q4, you could see that the gap between buying and sentiment was at about 30%. But when you look at the gap between buying and selling sentiment at the end of last year, that increased to 45%. And what that does is we're now seeing that there are far more willing buyers than there are willing sellers. And that creates a very interesting dynamic within our industry. It starts to talk to sh um, stock shortages and it talks a little bit to what we're anticipating with regards to um, property prices. Um, if we can go to the next slide. So understanding in Q4 what our customers are thinking and what we saw from a banking perspective, what does this mean for our industry going forward? Um, and specifically, what does this mean from an interest rate perspective? Um, and interest rates we know was the one of the biggest drivers to homeowner sentiment um, throughout last year. You know, the decrease of, um, you know, 3% 3, 3 of an interest rate actually allowed customers to um, enter into the property market. So what we started to see was first time home buyers who were previously renting for the same monthly rental, they could now afford a, a repayment on a mortgage loan. And we saw this drive of renters into buyers. And that was really predominantly that first time home buyer um, drive. What we also saw was with the lowering of the interest rates was customers were able to afford more. And so um, they were able to qualify for more and they were also able to buy, to buy up or ups, ups, upscale. Um, at the end of the day. And we think largely the, the sentiment with regards to home ownership, um, and especially in existing customers, was driven by lifestyle. So we're all working from home. And what does that mean? We look around our house and we think, well, now we definitely need a study or we definitely need a bigger garden for the kids to run around. And actually, if I'm going to be locked down in my house, I think I should start to invest in my house. And so the dynamics of the property industry started to emerge. The increase in first time home buyers, followed by existing customers now looking to upscale um, from, from a um, work from home perspective driven by lifestyle. What we also started to see was the investors start to come back um, with regards to understanding that there was opportunity in the property industry, the sentiment was good, and so they started to load more properties onto the portfolio. Um, with regards to interest rates, um, the 3% drop was quite a drastic drop for one year. And we think that that will continue to drive the um, that will continue to drive the sentiment of home ownership as we only anticipate that um, a gradual increase in interest rates will start to, to emerge towards only the end of this year and will only return to pre-lockdown levels at the end of 2023. So we're really going to see this gradual increase in interest rates and this is going to be one of those predominant drivers of home ownership. Um, from a house price perspective, um, what does this mean? So we've got willing buyers and we're slowly starting to see a few more willing sellers, but not at the rate of the willing buyers. And this demand and supply is going to start to play out um, into this year. We knew that there was a lot of activity in um, the price range of 750 to 1.5 million last year, um, but we also know that that is where we started to see a few stock shortages. Um, and so the introduction of um, developers bringing stock back onto the market is going to be um, very welcome for our willing buyers. Um, and we're interesting to see whether the willing buyer is going to push the house prices up or whether it's going to remain stagnant at the moment. The one thing that we have seen with regards to house prices, though, it did not dra drop as drastically as we anticipated when we first went into lockdown. So house prices actually remained fairly stable, if not slightly, um, slightly upwards uh, through 2020. But this demand and supply and the ability for us to release stock into the market is going to be what determines what house prices really are going to do. Um, this slide at the moment, this is talking now to market growth province. Um, and what you can see on the very right hand side, that is Western Cape. The red bars indicate 
the market decline that we saw in 2020. So despite seeing this massive recovery with regards to applications, sales of properties, and so on and so forth, um, in, the, in the latter half of last year, it was not sufficient for us to catch up on what we um, saw from a market, market growth perspective on 2019. However, the top row, those darker purple bars, is what we're anticipating from a market growth perspective going into 2021. And what you'll see from where you guys had the, the, the sharpest decline from a market growth perspective, and you're probably going to see the smallest um, increase in market growth, but it will still be positive. Um, this number is indicating 2% at the moment. However, in all great things with forecastings, you know, we always talk about last year, our crystal balls were, um, were exceptionally murky. Um, it still is a little bit murky. There's still quite a few levers that we're watching to anticipate growth. What we can say, it's going to be positive. But if I look at the applications we received in December last year, we were 40% higher app number of applications than in December of the previous year. And that just shows you that this continuous momentum that we were seeing in the second half of last year is continuing into this year. And for the first two months of 2021, up until the end of February, we were 20% higher in those two months than the previous year. And we've got to remember that the first two months, Jan to Feb, was prior to lockdown last year, and we're 22% up. So we actually think from an APSA perspective, we're going to need, need to revisit some of this forecasting um, because we actually think it might be higher than anticipated. The other levers though that we are watching, um, there are still instances where deeds offices um, still close for three days at a time in certain provinces. Um, uh, it hasn't quite happened within, um, uh, some of the regions, but in some of the other regions, we are still seeing that closure. We know in Gauteng North that was drastically impacted um, at the beginning of the year because they opened much later than they anticipated. Um, and also the return to um, government schooling in the middle of February also closed, started with a slightly slower um, turn to the market. So there are still some factors that may be headwinds and may impact the growth, but we are definitely seeing at the moment a very positive sign with regards to um, the property industry. We're definitely seeing um, a lot of um, interest from customers at the moment. And the one thing that holds true and something that we have seen throughout last year is that the, the South African sentiment of owning your own home, the South African sentiment of home ownership transcends any pandemic, transcends any crisis. And we think that is actually the main driver that we've seen within the property industry, um, and specifically even into the Western Cape, because that is a massive rebound that we are anticipating within your region. This sentiment of home ownership remains core to South Africans. And the, the aspiration that we want to place shelter and security around our family is still something that will continue to drive this industry. And so, you know, despite what we've all gone through last year, especially from an estate agent's perspective, where you guys were prevented from working for, for many months of last year, impacting back pockets as well as lifestyles, we just want to thank you from APSA for continuing to partner with us, for continuing to partner with private property as we all continue to aspire to house the nation and shape the industry in a meaningful well. Way. So just a few snippets from our side about what yep. we're seeing and what we're continuing to see. Um, and I think what we're going to move to now, um, Tracy, is to a little bit of a Q&A to make this a bit more interactive. And if you will allow me, I would like to call upon um, Dion van Zale, who is our, uh, my regional manager for Western Cape, if he can join me up on stage. So you guys also have a, a local face um, for APSA. And if there are any questions Thank you, Caroline. Um, Thank or comments you so, that so you would much. like can to ask hear me um, okay? after the session, let you're just, welcome to reach out let's to Dion. Let's say thank you myself. to Caroline and Thanks, maybe Trace. do a, a round of applause like we would. That was an incredible, incredible talk. Thank you, Caroline. Really interesting to note the sentiment, the overwhelming, um, positivity of it. Dion, welcome to the stage. Thank you, Tracy Lee Green. Thank <laughs> you so much. Great being here. <laughs> awesome. I think we've got a couple of questions here. One from Elise LaRue and one from Mark Stokel or Stokel, I think. I hope I pronounced that right. So let me read Elise's question first. And Dion, I believe you're going to field it for us, right? 
is so is this also because people believe that that this is a buyer buyer's market and property will be more affordable due to the to more distress properties being available i think she's referring to an earlier part of your of your presentation um caroline dion do you want to just perhaps um give us your thoughts on yes. this question absolutely uh, thank you so much for that for for that question i think it's an absolute great question um i think we all expected of of the COVID pandemic in the beginning of lockdown we all expected the market to be flooded by properties in distress now if i can perhaps just just um, indicate the following that during this period epsa launched a program that we call payment relief in that period 114,000 clients were actually given relief for three months not to pay their payments and guys on that that on that stage was 3.4 billion I'm glad to say that 94% of them is actually up to date as of today. So I don't think that whole thing about us waiting to see for distressed properties to flood flood the market is playing out at the moment. Not not more than it was in, in, in normal cases anyhow. And I hope also, that answers that question. I think it does. And also, Caroline, perhaps, you know, people thinking about reimagining how they live and wanting to invest in their own properties kind of gave those properties a new lease on life as well i i guess um here's another question from mark is your homeowner sentiment report index report sorry available publicly and can it be emailed to us i can say yes to that <laughs> absolutely caroline is that correct <laughs> okay absolutely yes absolutely so uh, mark if you your email address into the chat uh, or you can send it to us we will definitely add you onto our quarterly distribution list um, and this this report is actually also used by the Saab in their MPC meetings um, as an input when they determine rates and so on so um, absolutely this is yeah, a, a public report so happy to I'm add not you sure the which what, whether Caroline or Dion would be comfortable to answer this but it is um, what impact do you think expropriation has on the sentiment of buyers or sellers um Tracy I'm gonna I'm gonna start open <laughs> wow, I think all Thanks, tough Caroline. questions must go to I, I, I'm just going to start on my side, but that that green now makes me dis, distrust you. Now, <laughs> I think I, I think we have to be open-minded around this. I, I think we have to understand that this is something that is that is part of our living, part of our daily economic activities that's starting to play out. And I and I and I don't think on, on, on this stage we're going to take a side to say whether and whether it's going to play out on on, on 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 the bottom or on the top top side of it. So I think from a from a bank's point of view as well, we will we will go with what is currently in terms of our discussions with with government. We are part of those the, the discussions, and, and 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 let us see at, at the end if an if an if an a solution is put on the table that 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 will absolutely serve the best of 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 our country and 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 not being seen in the negative light um as 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 a lot of people is is referring to it at the moment okay um thank you for that dion obviously a very uh sensitive and um, multi-layered uh conversation that needs to happen and you know surely we won't be able to answer or touch on all the aspects of it yes. in one in one question um so there's a question from mark which is are the banks going to keep issuing 105 percent bonds throughout 2021 or while the interest rate uh rates are at seven percent and i think maybe Dion, if you can just tell us from APSA's perspective, of course, you're not speaking on behalf of everyone in the ecosystem, but you are speak, you can speak or give us an... A, a okay, so, so, so Mark, well, once again, thank you for that, the, the question. The, the 105, 5, 5 percent bonds is definitely, we, we are currently applying up in one of our sub-segments that we call the young professionals. I think I think we are we are definitely in the market to 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 start to test the markets for for what is the what is the result because remember offering a client 105% with cost 
is not always best advice for a client. You have to understand, can, can the affordability of this client over a period of time adjust it? And can, can the property appre appreciation adjust over a period of time? So, so yes, we are in the market. We are doing it in the, in the young professional market where we are financing young, young professionals with the NQFH or higher and, and, and is there to, to stay for us at the moment, most definitely. Thank you so, so much. Uh, Dion, I don't see any other major questions here for you, but like I said before, the beauty about this um, platform is, and the Nexus event is that we're here to facilitate direct engagement with key stakeholders, within key stakeholders. Here's one last question Absolutely. from Kyle. It's not yet been upvoted. Who's going to upvote that question for us so that Dion has to answer it? Okay, it's been upvoted twice already. Dion, what are your predictions? <laughs> they want you to get your crystal ball now. What are, aye, your aye, aye. what are your predictions once interest rates pick up and new buyers who budgeted according to the current interest rates, what would happen to these individuals? I think that's really a good question. Great. Lots of upvotes there. Dion, could you give us your thoughts on should yeah. interest rates... Okay. I... I I think the basic principle of that question, and, and, and again, what, what a great question, is that you must understand when we do credit assessment on a client, we do something that we call a stress test. So we do already anticipate a certain percentage of rate increase over a period of time. That compared with expected increases in salaries should uh, place that client in that same position as the economy moves. So, so we, we do, we do um, um, facilitate that process already in our credit assessment process. Okay, excellent. And then, Caroline, maybe some final thoughts uh, from your side. It's not often that we have you in the room, um, and it's a real privilege to have you on the stage with us today. Dion, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to excuse you, and thank you very much for joining us. Please don't leave. We still have a couple more presentations, but thank you so much for joining us on the stage. Caroline, just a few last words before you. Um, just from our side is, you know, if, it, if there was ever an industry to be in, it's the property industry. It's, it's a very emotive industry. We continue to make dreams come true. Um, and I think it's it's definitely something that we want to thank all of everybody on here um, for joining us in um, really making dreams come true for our customers. So thank you very much. And thank you to Private Property. It's for such a pleasure. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you, Dion. And thank you, APSA, for partnering with us with this series of Nexus Studio. I'm going to ask that we get the, to the next portion of our program, which is engagement. And for this one, unlike the physical event, I'm actually going to ask you to take your cell phone in your hand and go to www.menti.com studio. There we go. They've just put the code onto the screen with me. And when you get to the website, you punch in this code, which is 4562. 8137. Let me also acknowledge that I have two additional questions here. One from Mark Wilson. How do we feel that vaccines will affect confidence in the market? Perhaps our that are coming on later, um, either your head, Jan, or Carl would maybe like to take a stab at answering this question. And then I'm going to ask the ABSA team to also just give us their position regarding the financing of tiny homes or for tiny homes. Have you started looking at that? It's definitely something from a content point of view. We as private property have started looking into what a vibrant community that tiny home community is. All right. I think we've got a couple more. Let's wait a couple more minutes to see who else we can get into this menti Mentimeter. Remember, if you punch in a silly name, we're going to see it. So rather punch in your actual name um, so that, uh, well, we can keep things tidy. So we've got Deirdre, Tertia, Claudia, Trevor, Cherylise, Matt, Gemma, Deline, Nell, I see you there. Natasha, I see you. Chelsea, I see you. Denver, I see you. Uh, Iona, I see you. Let's, let's give it a few more minutes. We have 107 people in the room and we only have
uh, 36 of you on the Mentimeter. Let's see if we can push it up to 50. Let's see if we can push it up to 50. So we're just looking for 10 more people. Give me 10. There we go, 41. Who's that person? 41, 43. Let's push that number up to maybe 40, 49, 50. We're on 44 already. Chantal, I see you. Ricardo, Property Maverick, I see you there. Dwayne, I see you. Two more people and then studio. Let's lock it in. Let's go. Look how beautiful those names all actually form a little bit of a heart. So here we go. First question first. What is your job title or your role within the company that you are representing here today? So we know who we are talking to. All right. So the majority of you, let's let's get some more people in. Let's get some more votes in, some more responses in. 36 people, 41 people have responded, 43, and out of 43, 51 people by now, the majority of you I can see are property practitioners, property professionals, estate agents, and intern agents. Let's go to the next question, please. And this is the next mentee question. What type of real estate transactions do you specialize in? Whoa, rentals, quick off the mark. Sales and rentals, sales, 13, rentals. I wonder how this will fare up to the other provinces in terms of, you know, attendees. We had quite a, a number of people uh, tick the sales only box. Very interesting. We've also, let's go to the next question. Let's go to the next question, please, studio. Fantastic. This is my favorite question because, you know, we are, we put so many of these virtual events and virtual um, meetings together. I can tell you it was very difficult for me at the end. I get a lot of energy from people and having to fake that or make that energy work in a virtual environment, you, you, t you tend to multitask a little bit. So sometimes, most of you saying sometimes, uh huh. sometimes, and then some of you saying, yes, I am guilty. And nine of you saying I'm 100% focused. Look at that. So I guess it's probably related to the content. If the content is engaging, then it'll have your focused attention. Karen, thank you for that. Karen Duncan saying 100%. Studio, let's go to the next question, please. In your opinion, is it a buyer's market or a seller's market? And some of the other Nexus uh, uh, rooms asked us to actually add both, an option for both buyer and seller, but we really just want to get your opinion. You're the industry. You are the people that uh, that are in the coal face, literally, of this industry majority of you saying that it is very definitely a buyer's market. All right. Thank you so much for your opinion. Let's move on to the next one. Next question, please. Please, let's keep this clean. Let's keep it tidy. I know my people from the Cape. You know, 2020 was a different year. This is now 2021. So give me one word how you would describe 2021 so far. All right, there we go. Action packed, blessed, good, slow, exciting, challenging. We had a few words coming through yesterday, like tough. There was another one, crap. It's okay. Let's let's call a spade a spade. What does 20 like for you so far in one word all right thank you studio i think the biggest word here because that's how the, the word cloud works the biggest word is challenging so more than one person said challenging um blessed and good slow busy very very interesting we're all describing the same elephant isn't that fantastic to just as an idea we're all describing the same thing but we all have different experiences okay let's go on to the next question and this is the last question this is the last question in the section studio after this question can we please get our next speaker onto the stage um in fact we're going to take a five minute break and if there's a question in our q and a i'm going to suggest that you use that question as a way to break the ice in your networking break all right so if you could change one thing in the south african real estate industry right now what would it be agents working together you would encourage agents to work together you'd have red red less less red tape excuse me let me put my teeth back in you would the speed of conversions the eaab nothing that's a that's a lovely response nothing 
discount brokers, you'll scrap the expropriation bill, mandatory deposits on offers, prevent the Poppy Act from coming into play, Sunday show houses. That is so interesting. Okay, so let's, this is it. Like we, I think we can close off the section of the, you can still enter in your, your comments and then we will still be able to look at them later. And what we always do at the end of these events, within a week or two, we send you a report. And in that report, we tell you sort of what the overwhelming sentiment was. Okay, we're going to take a short break now. I need to refill my coffee. I hope you do too. During the break, however, it's an opportunity for you to network with the people at your table. There can only be so many people at a table, like I think six or eight. And if you want to participate in the conversation of the table, switch on your microphone and then switch on your camera. And then that way you can discuss possibly some of the things you'd like to change about the industry. I know it's strange meeting people in your own private environments. I don't know where you're joining from, but you know, take a chance and connect. It's a nexus. I'll see you guys in five minutes. And welcome back, welcome back. I've just punched in welcome back. If you're back with me, please drop me a little emoji, something that describes how you're feeling right now. If you're back with us, we're about to call onto the stage our head of, well, PayProps head of data and, and analytics. Her name is your head Smuts. And then later on the stage, she'll be joined by the CEO of PayProp, Jan Dabel, who will be sharing some very interesting information with us that I think you'll be very, very keen to hear. So what, uh, your head, are you back? Are you on the stage yet? There you are. There you are, lovely. Are you still in Salenbosch, Mama? <laughs> this week, yes. Fantastic, fantastic. Welcome. Thank you to everyone. Um, hi, Treshka van Aswegen. Wendy, I see you. Karen, I see you. Kobe, I see you. Natasha, thank you so much for really just um, engaging with us and being focused. This next part really drills into the rental market. So without me giving too much of a, a build up to this, your hit, you're more than capable of taking us through. Thank you, Tracy. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for taking the time to listen to me this morning. Um, I'm going to share my screen in a second. There are quite a few graphs. Uh, they're not that complicated, um, but I'm going to switch off my camera so that the presentation is on your full screen. Let me just get the right screen here. There we go. There we go. All right. So as Tracy said, I will be talking to you about what is going on. Hello, Dennis. Uh, I'll be talking to you about what is what went on in the um, rental market in 2020. As most of you know, PayProp is a, a transactional platform for rental agents. So that is where we pull our data from. I'm going to chat to you about firstly rent, then arrears. That was a big topic for the year 2020. I'll also touch on credit metrics. And then lastly, everyone joining this week is getting a bit of a sneak peek of our second paper of state of the rental industry survey results. So I'll end with a few highlights um, from that. That hasn't been released yet. So you are getting uh, secret uh, sneak peek information about that. Starting with rent. So on your screen, you can see the um, inflation line, that's the blue one, and then the rental growth, that is the red one. So you can see there at the, throughout 2019, rental growth trended between 3 and 4% more or less, and also mostly below inflation. So rental growth is increasing at a lower pace than inflation. And then there's a dip there in April, May when lockdown was first announced. And in November, we saw the first ever, since we started the paper rental index in 2012, the first ever negative year-on-year -year rental growth. 
So what that means is that between November 2019 and November 2020, rental growth actually decreased um, by 0.3%. So rent got a little bit cheaper. So why did we see the, the rental growth under such pressure in the last year? So there are a few reasons. There's a demand side re the reason and a supply side reason that I will get to in a second. But not surprisingly, affordability played a big role for many tenants. I think we all know someone who lost um, either their full income for a bit or just a partial, partially um, loss of income. And that affected their ability to either move into larger properties or they just simply couldn't afford larger rental increases. So instead of paying a six or seven percent increase, they would prefer to move to a similar priced property instead of paying that increase. So that's on the demand side. Then on the supply side, there are two reasons. Many Airbnb properties that were sitting empty because of uh, travel bans weren't earning any income and many of these were moved to the long-term rental market. So that flooded the market with rental properties. And then secondly, due to the favorable interest rates, many investors are still buying buy-to-let properties. And that, again, increased the supply of rental properties in the market. So both that lower demand for more expensive properties and the oversupply in the rental market puts downward pressure on rental growth. Do we see that changing in the near future? The short answer is no, because both of these are very inelastic in the short term, meaning it takes a longer time for these two um, factors to move back into equilibrium. Looking at basically the same statistics, just uh, measured quarterly year on year, um, and we added a trend line, so you can clearly see the downward trend that rental growth followed over the last two years. It's worth noting that in 2017, 2018, these rental growth figures were at six, seven percent. So in 2019, rental growth was already under pressure. And then you can clearly see lockdown hit there at the beginning or quarter two of 2020 and rental growth literally halved between the first quarter and the second quarter. At the end of the year, it was only at 0.2% year on year. So again, what that means is between the fourth quarter of 2019 and the fourth quarter of 2020, the average rent only increased by 10 Rand. Now, if we compare the Western Cape, and I know that we've been saying the Western Cape was the darling of the rental market for so long, but this feels like a distant memory. Over the last two years, we can see that the Western Cape rental growth in red was lower than the national average, and in the last three quarters of last year, actually saw negative rental growth, meaning that year on year, rent actually became a bit cheaper in the Western Cape. Putting this in perspective, out of all the provinces, five had negative rental growth. So don't feel so bad, Western Cape. Four other provinces also experienced negative rental growth. The Western Cape at, is the only province with average rent at over 9,000 Rand and is the, the most expensive province in which to live in the country. Moving on to arrears. So when we look at arrears at Payprop, we look at two different metrics. We first look at the percentage of tenants in arrears, and then we also look at the average size of arrears relative to rent. I'm gonna show you both, and they followed slightly different um, trends. You can see here on your screen that the percentage of tenants in arrears in the first quarter started at 19.4%. Then at the end of quarter one, lockdown was announced, and that then increased to 25%, meaning that April, May, June, one in every four tenants were in arrears. And I'll explain why we, why we saw that in a second. Uh, good news though, is that that figure um, improved again uh, towards the end of the year. So it's peaked already, it is slowly improving, but it is not yet at pre-lockdown levels. Looking at the other metric, 
So at the beginning of last year, a tenant on average owed almost 80% of one month's rent um, if a tenant were in arrears. Again, that peaked or that increased, that peaked in the third quarter and um, improved a bit in the last quarter. So it is quite a way off the pre-lockdown level. And this um, arrears metric is a bit more sticky than the percentage tenants in arrears. So why did we see, why did that, that metric move the way it did? So if you look at the percentage tenants in arrears, I think we all also were in the situation that you weren't necessarily sure how your cash flow, what your cash flow would look like in lockdown. And many tenants obviously experienced the same. Didn't know if they were going to stay home for a month or two, if they were going to take a pay cut. So due to that cash flow uncertainty, many tenants um, stop paying their rent in full. Um, we also saw that many made payment arrangements with the agents and landlords. And then towards the end of the second, towards the middle of the second quarter, it was announced that the economy is going to op start opening slowly. Many tenants uh, went back to work. And then because they had cash flow certainty, they started paying their rent in full again and paid off arrears. Those tenants who could, who still had jobs, who still got their full income, paid off their arrears. On the flip side of that, we saw the average arrears percentage peak in quarter three. So these tenants who just went back to work on the 1st of June paid off their um, rental arrears. Because those arrears were cleared mathematically, the average was pushed up. And that is why this metric only um, peaked in the third quarter. Now, if you still don't have a full salary or you still you perhaps lost your job or your partner lost their job, you are still in a difficult financial position. And this is why those that remaining arrears are actually so sticky. Because if you think about it, to reduce that arrears percentage, you have to pay your, your rent in full plus pay extra to reduce um, your average arrears, which is difficult to do for, for many tenants in the current economic climate. So let's compare Western Cape statistics to the national statistics. At the beginning of last year, only 15% tenant, 15 of tenants were in arrears. This is the lowest percentage of arrears out of all the provinces. Um, and, but the Western Cape followed the same trend, peaked in the second quarter at 21% and ended the year at 18% below the national average, but still above the 15.3% uh, that we saw pre-lockdown. Then if we look at average arrears percentage, the province started at a lower than national uh, level at 69% call it, and then that actually increased all the way to 106%. That was then above the national average and then improved slightly in the last, oh, not slightly, significantly in the last quarter to 94%. But again, still a long way off the 69% that we saw in the first quarter. So this metric is going to take a bit longer um, to recover to those pre-lockdown levels. Moving on to credit metrics. So where we get these metrics is our clients are able to do credit checks through the pay prop system and we tally up uh, all, all the metrics in those credit checks, average them and then report on them. So it's not necessarily the credit profile of a current tenant, it's the credit profile of someone applying for a rental property. So those, while they might overlap, aren't necessarily the same samples. So just keep that in mind. So nationally, I'm not going to talk through all of these. I uh, just want to highlight one or two. You can see a metric like tenants with delinquencies. I'm oh, sorry. Tenants with delinquencies. Started the year at 18.4%, then increased in the second quarter, the first quarter of lockdown, and then that um, recovered quite nicely back to pre-lockdown levels in quarter four. 
we all know that the repo rate was um, lowered substantially last year by three and a half basis points, I mean, three and a half percentage points. And you can see the impact of that on the percentage of debt, percentage of someone's income that they spend on debt. So at the beginning of last year, almost half of a tenant's net income was spent on debt repayments, and towards the end of the year, it was closer to 40%. Now, if you spend a smaller percentage of your income on debt, you have more disposable income left at the end of the month, which is what we see here. I was quite surprised to see that this credit score, which is basically a summary of someone's credit profile or credit health, actually increased during the year. I know it's only about three points, but it was really encouraging to see that tenant health overall didn't deteriorate as much as I expected. If we compare the Western Cape nationally, I can tell you that it's mostly good news. Uh, the Western Cape has the highest um, income out of all the provinces. Also, the I think the lowest or second lowest um, percentage of tenants with major delinquencies. So a major delinquency can include something like uh, notices, defaults, just uh, judgments, um, accounts with accounts in arrears with three months um, or more. So that includes a, a list of things. And then lastly, I just want to mention that credit score in the Western Cape is nine points higher than national. So overall, tenants in the Western Cape have really good um, credit health. Why did these metrics improve in 2020? So if I say improve, I'm talking about the credit score that increased a bit over the year. So if I had to take a few educated guesses, then these will be it. We all know that low income tenants, low income Consumers in general in the country were hit a bit harder during lockdown, so they lost more jobs. Um, yeah, lost more jobs during lockdown, and it's possible that these tenants moved out of the rental market over the short term, moved in with family. So there aren't credit checks being done on these lower income tenants, and they aren't pulling down the average due to this. Tenants could also be staying longer in their properties due to affordability reasons I mentioned earlier. And since they're not applying for new and more expensive properties, we're not doing credit checks on these tenants. Hopefully, some tenants are also a bit financially more responsible after COVID. I think we all had a bit of a fright and we had to rethink the amount of money that we spend on booze and entertainment. And it's possible that tenants use that extra money during lockdown to pay off their debt or save a bit more. So they are possibly financially a bit more responsible. I did mention the effect that lower interest rates had on the debt to income ratio. So tenants are spending a smaller percentage of their income on debt. And like I mentioned, I was expecting credit metrics to worsen uh, also because good tenants now with a lower interest rate can actually afford to buy a home and actually with their good credit uh, qualify for, for bonds. Um, but that seems to be not the case and there are still good tenants out in the market. Lastly, the funnest bit of this presentation is the sneak peek a sneak peek of our State of the Rental Industry survey results. So this is the second time that we did this. Uh, we did one at the end of 2019 and again at the end of 2020. And to give you a quick overview of who took part, because we send it to our list of paper users and industry players, should be no surprise that 95% of participants works in the property industry. 69% were either a business owner or a rental agent. So they really are on the ground. They know what's going on. So they have a, a good feel for the market. And then 64% manage smallish rental portfolios, 150 properties uh, or less. First category, and I think after the year that was 2020 and with COVID and working from home, 
uh, technology was the biggest category. And I want to share just three insights with you. So 55% of uh, participants said that they increased the use of technology in their business during COVID. These are actually 55% said they fully agree. Another 25% that they said they agree that it increased the use. So we're closer to 80% of people who said that they increased the use of technology in their business. 70% said they don't think that virtual viewings and 3D tours are going to go away when things return back to normal, normal in quotation marks. Uh, they think that that is here to stay. And then 69% said that they believe it's more productive to increase automation than to increase the workflow. So that's a great example of working smarter and not harder. A few things on the average rental portfolio. 70% of participants said that the rental increases that they put through in 2020 was lower than normal. So that was that you can see in that rental growth graph but that again also boils down to affordability. This one was quite shocking to me. 93% of participants made payment arrangements with tenants. So that should give you an idea of just how many tenants were affected by, um, affected financially by lockdown. 55% said that they have more vacant properties than normal during the year last year. And that again speaks to that oversupply um, that we looked at earlier. And then 64%, this is a bit of a worrying number, 64% said that they lowered their commission during 2020 to keep a mandate. Now, this is a bit problematic and I, people don't necessarily always Think about this, but once you've lowered your commission, your commission is your main source of income in your rental business. Once you've lowered your commission percentage, it's going to be very difficult to raise it again. So it is just something to consider. You have to justify a higher commission percentage at some stage, um, and that's a bit more difficult to do than lowering your commission. Looking at challenges quickly, 51% said that finding good tenants is the single biggest challenge. The second one was arrears. So both of these, again, boils down to affordability, the effect of lockdown on tenants' pockets. And then 68% said the ongoing effect of COVID is their biggest worry for 2021. And I'll end with some good news. Uh, the last question of the survey, how optimistic are you about the future of the rental market? Only 5% said that they were pessimistic. 17% said that they don't really have an opinion. They feel quite neutral about this. And a whopping 78% said that they were optimistic about the future of the rental market. So I went to have a look at the 2019 statistic. And at the end of 2019, only 62% of participants said that they were optimistic about the rental market. So maybe we all think a little differently about life uh, after lockdown. And uh, maybe our spirits are lifted and we are more optimistic in general. If you want some more information about rent arrears, credit metrics, and also a few other interesting articles, you can download the latest annual rental index um, at that address and I'll also um, put that in the chat box for you in a second. Thank you for listening. I'm going to hand over to Jan. There we go. Good, every, good morning everybody. Um, I'm with Sunny Stellan Wash. Lovely to see quite a number of familiar names and places. Uh, always our pleasure and our privilege to participate in these events. And I um, want to thank uh, Paul, Tracy, Lee, all the wonderful people at Father Property for this opportunity. Now, unlike the other presenters, I did not prepare a PowerPoint presentation for you. Should I have, uh, I probably would have had to title it uh, Death by PowerPoint because today, looking at what the future holds, I'm going to. Uh, just give you some insights into the new Property Practitioners Act and more specifically the regulations. Um, 
And as you all know, the Property Practitioners Act was promulgated or published on 3 October 2019 already. And with that being the case, you may be wondering why we as estate agents are still working in accordance with the old act, the Estate Agency Affairs Act of 1976. I think we all agree that this 45-year-old piece of legislation is overdue for replacement. Um, since this old act dates back to an era before the internet, digital marketing, social media, very important, but also before automated and integrated payment platforms such as PayPal. The reality is that the old act simply does not cater for today's realities. So how is it going to play out this year and further? Considering the, the, the new act, we must remember that this act, and like any other new act in itself, only sets out the broad principles of the law and it does not deal with the implementation thereof. That is where regulations to an act setting up the implementation and the application of the act. Now, although the act was published in October 2019, its regulations have not been finalized published in the government gazette and only once that is published will the act be implemented and will we all be working in accordance with the new legislation when is that likely to be we don't know but we do have a, a, a good idea of what the draft regulations to the property practitioners act uh, entail due to COVID-19 and the lockdown regulations the opportunity to submit comments on these draft regulations was extended to 20 November last year, and now we await the final regulations. So let's have a look at what we can expect. And I'm going to share my screen with you, with technology allowing, and I'm going to try not to scroll around too much. I just might make you seasick. So let's just get to the correct screen. Anybody see my screen? Here we go. I'm going to start with section 54 of the Act. In other words, trying to understand the intention of the legislator. Now, I'm not going to read it verbatim. It's uh, quite comprehensive. Uh, I don't want to spend time, but I do um, want to point, you out, point out certain articles or sections to you. And I do suggest that you discuss these stipulations with your legal advisor and definitely with your auditor. But let's have a look. When we consider the contents of section 54, it deals with trust accounts. Now, most of you, well, probably all of you, will be familiar with section 32 of the old Act, the State Agency Affairs Act, that deals with trust monies. Now, section 54 is materially the same. And I'm just going to point out a few lines. And it says, in subsection one, that every property practitioner must open and keep one or more separate trust accounts with certain references in it. And then it must immediately, after, after opening a trust account, must appoint an auditor. And then immediately after that, you must notify the authority in respect of such account and the appointment of the auditor. Now, the authority is the EIAB. It's a new name. Um, but the principles haven't changed. If I scroll down a bit, um, subsection 2 says, despite subsection 1, any property practitioner may invest in a separate savings account the funds that are not immediately required, same as in the old act, uh, section 32, sub 2. And then this new section 54 carries on telling you what you must do. Uh, once again, what you must do, and then also, as you probably know, published in, 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 in other languages. Then there are further must do's, audit report, and then the authority may certain do, do certain things, and the court may do certain things. But all of this is materially similar to the old act. What is, however, very different, and if we now scroll up, and I'm just going to click through it immediately, is Considering section 23 of the Act, once again looking at the intention of the legislator. And if we read that together, 23 sub 1 says, a property practitioner whose turnover is below 2.5 million must cause his, her, or its accounting records to be subjected 
for an independent review by a registered accountant subject to the provisions of section 54 that deals with trust members. Now, just looking at the heading of this section, it says exemptions in respect of accounting records and trust accounts. So the, the concept of an exemption is new. And then if we look at a threshold of 2.5 million rand, and that I deduce must be per annum, must cause his or her or its accounting records to be subjected to an independent review. It's no longer a formal audit. And this review can be conducted by a registered accountant, no longer a chartered accountant. So that is a significant change that we need to consider. So let's read subsection two. The minister may, by notice in the Gazette, and that's the government Gazette, determine the circumstances under which certain property practitioners may be exempted from keeping trust accounts. That's new. Property practitioners, as you know, are state agents. They can or they may be exempted from keeping trust accounts, which of course will lead to significant cost savings. And further, the minister may, by notice in the government gazette, determine if the different may determine a different dispensation for the review of accounting records. In other words, no longer audits. So this is the intention of the act as I stated before. Now we need to consider how it's going to be implemented and how it's going to be applied. And for, now we can jump to the prop, uh, property practitioner regulations that were published in 2020. And let's see if the intention of the legislature is now more clear. And once again, I confirm that these are draft regulations. It, uh, I have reason to believe that this is pretty much final after numerous drafts that were open for public comment for a very long time, but it is not active yet. So it says, this is regulation four of the, of the regulations, and, it's, and the heading says, exemption from trust accounts pursuant to the provisions of section 23, that is the one we've just read. The following is prescribed. A property practitioner is exempted from keeping a trust account if that property practitioner has never received any trust monies other than as permitted in regulation 4.4. So no trust monies or complying with regulation 4.4 and we will get to that. Subsection 2, a property practitioner is exempted from keeping a trust account if he no longer receives any trust monies other than as permitted in Regulation 4.4. So the fact that you have been using it, um, it can also, it's, it's not going to prevent you from applying for exemptions. So if those two subsections, um, um, the contents thereof are complied with, you also have to submit to the authority an affidavit in a prescribed form and that affidavit is actually in these regulations. You can see exactly what it is that you have to complete in order to apply for exemption. And this will only, only be applicable if you are compliant with all these other regulations and you give a certain undertaking that you will not be receiving any trust funds after the date of your affidavit. And moving on that you provide evidence to the authority that any previously existing trust account have been winded down in terms of these regulations. I'm not going to read all the detail, but that is the crux of the matter. You can read it at your own time. All of these are published. It's available on the internet. Please seek advice on it. When we consider regulation 4.2, it says, where a property practitioner is exempted in terms of the above, provided that the property practitioner has had any previously existing trust account reviewed in terms of the relevant act, such property practitioner will not be required to again have such account review or audited. It's done its history, you've paid for it, it is now time to move on. Regulation 4.3 states, where a property practitioner is exempted in terms of the above and has complied with the above regulation, 
such property practitioner will be exempted from having to have its business and the other accounts audited and will only be required to have such accounts independently reviewed by a registered accountant. So it's no longer a formal audit of your trust account, also taking cognizance of your business accounts. You can simply appoint an accountant that who has to do an independent review. Much simpler, much cheaper, um, and definitely a benefit in a highly fragmented market. Um, cost savings always welcome. Right, so looking at 4.4, that is probably the most important regulation if you are a rental estate agent who wants to uh, make use of this opportunity, take this opportunity to simplify your business and save seriously on audit costs. 4.4 states that a property practitioner will further be exempted, so further because you need to meet all the other criteria, and in this case, there's no particular threshold. It doesn't matter what your annual turnover is. So a property practitioner will further be exempted from operating a trust account and having an audited if the property practitioner is otherwise compliant in terms of these regulations. And then there are five more things, the conditions that you have to meet. You have to mandate one or more other property practitioners that specialize in collecting and distributing trust payments. And such property practitioners will be referred to as the payment processing agent. That is typically a PIPROP. And that, that uh, payment processing agent must process such trust payments on behalf of the estate agency in respect of all trust funds. So all trust funds or rental trust funds must be um, managed by the payment processing agent and you may not have any other trust funds in other trust accounts. Important in 4.4.1 is that your payment processing agent must also be a property practitioner in terms of this same law and this same regulations. It must have a valid FFC, etc. Looking at the contents of 4.4.2, and this is and, remember, it's all the above, and each payment processing agent mandated by the estate agency operates a trust environment that complies with the Act and associated regulations. So when you use a payment processor, that payment processor must have a trust environment, a complete holistic trust environment of all the agencies whose business uh, it manages, and that trust environment must be fully compliant. 4.4.3 is, remember, it's and. Each payment processing agent, like the PayProp, mandated by the estate agency, operates within that one trust environment, separately auditable client accounts, both in respect of each agency to whom it's provide such services and in respect of each client of each property practitioner. So your payment processor, has to do segregation of trust funds, not only by agency by agency, but within an agency's account, must also segregate each landlord's trust funds, each tenant's trust funds within the bigger trust environment. And then looking at 4.4.4, the trust environment and each of the client accounts operated by the payment processing agent must be audited annually in compliance with the Act and regulations, and the audit reports in respect of must be submitted to the authority, that's the EIB, in compliance with the Act and the regulations. So your payment processor must also go through an audit process, and they must still also submit their audit reports and put you in a position to submit that. And then lastly, when an agency uses such payment processor, you may not hold trust monies, any trust money, whatever, outside of the manner provided for above. Now, the good news is that many of you who use uh, accredited payment processing agents can apply for this. I'm just going to scroll down and show you. There's an actual E on page 11 of the regulations. It's an affidavit by the property practitioner 
in respect of trust monies, and that's where you start your process to apply for exemption subject to all of the above. So I'm pointing this out to you. I'm not trying to give you legal advice. I'm confirming once again that these are only draft regulations. We are awaiting the final publication. We don't know where it's going to, when it's going to be, but you may want to consider this. And I think um, there is some relief, especially for the smaller estate agencies and specifically the newer ones. And on that note, that's what we can expect from a different perspective. I thank you all for your time and thank you back to you, Tracy Lee. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jan. I have a couple of questions here for you. I know we're running up against the clock a little bit, but sure. if you can bear with us, we have one more speaker that we'd like to bring onto the stage. And it is Carl Vandenberg from Private Property, who's going to talk to us a little bit about the future of private property and how private property and the brand uh, is planning, it's planning its destiny, its road ahead. So, yes, one or two questions that I think, uh, Jan, while you're here with me, um, I think it would be important for us to just deal with. Um, one was from Penelope Gurney, and it received two, uh, uh, two votes, I think. Are we on the old or the new order rate referring to Section 23? for the 2021 tax year? That's one question. And the next question I'd like you to look at is one from Iona Schultz, which is a very, very good question actually. Is turnover of 2.5 million on the actual sales of the property or is it the is it 2.5 million turnover on the commission earned by us? If you can handle those two questions for us, Jan, I'd appreciate it. In the meantime, studio, let's get Carl van der Berg and the team. 100%. So just scrolling back, uh, are we on the old or the new audit regulations for the 2021 tax year? Now, this, depending, so at the moment, this is not active yet. So as we sit here today, we are still in terms of the old regulations because the new ones will come into play once, only once it is. Um, once it is published, and then with that, the, the EIIB or the authority will also have to then confirm uh, as to how it's going to be applied. That will be a practice note. So, um, Penelope, where we are now, the new ones, it's the, the new uh, Section 23 is not applicable yet. Then, looking at uh, Iona's question, is turnover of 2.5 million sale of property or is it commission earned? Remember that th this deals with client money. It's trust money. So um, the turn the turnover is my my interpretation would be um, the flow of funds through through your account. Uh, the turnover in the account. So difficult to say, but if we consider in most cases, 2.5 million is is the value of one property. Uh, two properties on average. So this is the income through your business. Um, to turn over through the account is, is how I would interpret that. Thank you, Tracy Lee. Thank you so much, Jan. And just to echo what Jan was saying is that we're not giving, obviously not giving legal advice here. We're just offering an interpretation and a way to look at some of the clauses. Am I correct, Jan? Would you, would you be correct in saying there's still... There's still a little bit that we all need to understand, but thank you, Jan, for bringing this information to our attention. I'm going to excuse you now from and um, ask that Carl van der Berg. Bye bye. Bye bye. Take care. What are you doing? Carl is rolling in <laughs> like a gangster. <laughs> I've got this wonderful light in, How my, you doing in my office, and it looks like I have a halo over my head when I've got it on, so I forgot to switch it off. Hi there, Tracy. Okay, guys. Hi, hi. Okay, so Carl, you're here today to talk to us a little bit about what the future holds for the private property brand and what partnership looks like. I just want to remind everyone that you are here today at Nexus, and it's a Nexus with a specific focus on Cape Town, the Atlantic seaboard area, northern and southern suburbs, and then the South Peninsula area. So, and also to thank ABSA for being our strategic partner in bringing this particular nexus through to you. Don't forget to use the chat box to interact. You guys are pros at this already. If you have a question, 
pop that question in there. As you can see, if you click on Q&A, you can see Penelope's question. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, and hello to the extended private property family in, in Cape Town. Uh, it's an absolute privilege for us to be able to, to interact with you guys today. Um, you know, obviously over the last year, we've really, really missed being in person with you guys, having a cup of coffee and just sharing our, our knowledge and our understanding of what's happening in the property market. So we're really, really grateful that we found this, this platform and it's a wonderful way for us to really interact. So today I'm really just going to cover around a couple of points around where's private property at the moment and where it is that we're going. And then uh, I'll vacate the, the stage and Feline will join us, uh, our provincial head for the Western Cape, and she'll run through some of the insights that we're seeing in your specific areas. So really, let's get started on this. Uh, where is private property? What are we doing? Well, we're choosing to become the tr trusted partner in the property industry. So as an example, let's look at today, right? Today we're in the center of the ecosystem as private property and we're pulling in our partners with EBSA and PayPop and we, we're bringing, bringing in real estate, everybody else in real estate, and we're just sharing knowledge. And that's what it is that we really wanted to be is in the center of the ecosystem to do with anything with property. So we've got two main sides to this ecosystem really. And the one is our consumers, what we classify as people that are shopping, that are buying, that are wanting to rent. And then on the other side, we've got our partners and our clients, that's estate agents, attorneys, banks, bond originators, and everybody else on the other side. So if we need to be in the center, it's a bit of a balancing act, right? So if we listen a little bit too much to what our clients are wanting, we run the risk of alienating 57 million people. And what are those 57 million people? They're just gonna vote with their feet and they find another place to, to research property and find out uh, about property and buy property. Again, likewise, if we focus too much on the consumer, we run the risk of alienating our, our clients. So it's a bit of a tightrope, but it's something that we're choosing to be and it's something that we're doing really, really well as of late. If we then go on to, you know, how is it that we're going to become this trusted partner? It really is around being completely customer obsessed. And again, it's real estate, it's consumers, it's everything. It's if we have a complete obsession and a complete understanding of what it is that people that are using our, our portal to search for properties, what are they, what are their pain points? What are they wanting to get out? What is it that real estate needs? What are their pain points? If we have a complete understanding around that, we have the ability to solve real people's problems. And we're choosing to solve these real people problems with digital technology. So again, uh, if you understand the customer really, really well, you have the ability to solve real problems. And once you've got that, you then have the ability to really create some magic and actually create valuable propositions. In one of our earlier nexuses this week, there was a, a comment around a pain point that a client, that a, a real estate agent had. And that was the, their suggestion was that, you know, if somebody enters into an or signs an offer to purchase, they should be pre-qualified first before they even allowed to do that. Now, an example of a really, really good value proposition is if we can, as private property, understand our consumer incredibly well and use things like an EBSA pre-approval. And when we give the lead over to yourself, so when the consumer says, listen, I want to go look at that property, we can give you the lead that you know the person is pre-qualified by EBSA. You know that they're looking in, at a three-bedroom house in a certain area. You know that they've got 2.5 uh, children and a cat and a dog. And that's the journey that we need to work together to be able to create. So some real magic there on the end, but you've got to have those first two steps first. So where is private property in our five-year strategy? 2019 was really all about preparation. We got a brand new CEO. He brought in a, a brand new executive team. I think I'm one of the oldest ones in the business. I've been in business about 18 months. In 2019, we really just sat back and went, where is this business now and where do we need to take it to, to really, really grow? So that was 2019, 2020. I'll spend a little bit of time on, on the next slide, but that was our foundation year. 2021 is our innovation year and it's our watershed moment for private property. This is the year that we bring proper technology into the, the ecosystem of real estate. And it's a real, real important year for us. And I'll share a little bit of information around what it is that we're going to be doing. 2022 is about repositioning, 23 is optimizing. 2024 is really about scaling it because once you've got the right market share, you've got enough consumers coming in, we can really, really, really give a lot of value to, to all of our partners. If you didn't notice, and Tracy mentioned, we look fundamentally different uh, right now as opposed to a year ago. I don't even remember being that red, blue, and white color anymore. 
And it's not to us, it's not just a brand change. It's not just a brand refresh. It's not just a green color. It marked an anniversary, and today's that anniversary day. It's our first year. Although we're a 22-year-old business, this is our first birthday as a new business. We look different, we communicate different, we show up different, and we engage very, very differently. So it's far from just a pretty green color for us as part of property. We live and breathe this brand now as, as, as a business. Where are we? So by the end of that five-year strategy, we wanted to be at, at 5 million unique users every single month on, on our portal. It might seem like a bit of an ambitious number, but let me share some information. Right now, we're averaging 3.2 million unique users every single month. Let's put that into perspective. A year ago, this time, we were, it's a million, a million consumer growth 12 months ago. And if we compare it to two years ago, we've grown by more than 2 million unique users every single month. That's our, so right now, 3.2 million unique people coming onto our portal and looking at your properties. We're incredibly proud of that growth. We're ahead of our, of our, our expectations. And we really, really are going to see an accelerated growth specifically at the end at the second half of this year. So I want to spend a bit of time talking around sort of evolution of technology. So there's, there's this whole thing around, you know, are we in an evolution or a revolution? You know, you've got prop tech, you've got fintech and all of these words. And is it moving fast? Which direction is it moving in? So I want to just unpack this a little bit. So let's look at an evolution of technology. Um, if you take your old Nokia 2110 and you hold it up to your iPhone 12, you would look at that side by side and go, that is an absolute revolution in technology. Where in fact it actually isn't because 21, these two cell phones were made almost 25 years apart. That's actually an evolution. It's a slow and gradual change in technology and speed and, and how it is that we operate. A revolution, and an example of a revolution is what we've all just gone through. 12 months ago, we used to sit in our Schlanger offices in Durban KZN with 180 degree sea views and life was great. Now, we're working in our home offices. I'm in my home office. I'm waiting for my children to barge through the door and join this meeting today. That's an example of a revolution change in technology. A year ago, most of us hadn't heard of Remo, which we're on today. We haven't heard of Google Hangouts. We never used Teams. We didn't know what Zoom was. And we've all completely adapted to this new and sudden change. What's really important is it's not just us that has changed, but the consumers, the people that are buying, that are renting, the landlords, they have fundamentally changed how they shop and how they look for property. We heard your head speaking around virtual reality. It's a key part of the, of the future around searching for property. Virtual realities and metaphors and the rest of it. Consumers want to know property very, very well before they start looking at, at it, which is a good thing for real estate, in my opinion, because you start now really separate the buyers from the shoppers. I know a day in the life of a real estate agent. I can only imagine listing a new property and getting three, four, five hundred leads in, in a single day. How are you ever going to get to that? So our view and our goal as part of property really is to start separating those buyers from the shoppers and give you quality leads. Another example is Facebook. If you look at our social media, we, we fast approaching 700,000 people on our, on our social media. Just on Facebook alone, we're almost at 550,000. Every time we put one of your properties onto our Facebook page, we get 15, 000, on average 15,000 impressions per property. In fact, we did a, a virtual show day the other day for, I think it was a Western Cape property. We had 500,000 people view that video. That is a fundamental change in how people shop for property and how they engage. And us as a business and yourselves as real estate, we need to make sure that we're ahead of that and we understand that and we can engage with these new consumers. In terms of building a modern platform, in a few months' time, we'll start engaging quite heavily with yourselves and doing some change management. So there's going to be a fundamental change in, in private property and how it is that you engage with us. So essentially, we're going to have two arms to private property. One is a consumer-based one, which is a new website and a new app. This allows us to know our consumers significantly better, allows them to search for your properties much, much better. It has higher Google ad, uh, ranking and all the rest of those great things that come with the use of new technology. On the other side, we'll be having a brand new uh, client portal, which is for yourselves, where you'll be able to gather and know this information. The same stuff that we're sharing with you today, you'll be able to start getting an understanding of what is your market share? What are your leads? Where are your leads coming from? Where are these consumers based that are viewing your properties? 
that is what it is that we're going to be launching in a few months' time. It starts out as quite a basic shell. It looks great. It interacts really, really well. And over time, every two to four weeks, we'll be launching new and uh, exciting products and features on these two portals. So we're looking incredibly forward to these things. Again, you imagine the day when you start getting a lead and you know exactly that there's an 80% probability that this person is at the very least going to put in an offer, that they've got an absolute pre-approval. That, that day is not far off. We just all need to walk in that same direction, which is why we value yourselves as partners so much. I suppose the, the final point is really around humanizing the digital journey. Um, we use the word disruption. And I, I fear that the word disruption has got a really negative connotation. So people hear disruption and they go specifically in this industry and they start going, what does disruption mean? Does that mean they're going to cut out myself as an agent? How is that going to impact me? And all of these things. In our view, it's completely opposite to that. Let's understand this. In South Africa, property ownership is highly emotive. It's probably the single biggest purchase any South African is ever going to do in their lives. There is a human being that is selling, there's a human being that is buying, there's a human agent that's facilitating, there's a human attorney, and there's a human behind the bank, believe it or not. But that is the key and the important thing. What is really, really important is that we use technology to make your lives more efficient, to make the consumer's lives a lot easier. So that to us is really around how we wanting to disrupt the real estate market. We wanting to bring technology to the fore and allow you to simplify your lives. As I said in the first one of the first slides, if we're customer obsessed, we can solve real problems and we can create some real, real, real magic. So thank you again for everybody for joining us today. I think I'm going to come off this. Feline's going to join and she's going to start sharing some really, really good information around what's happening in your area from a private property perspective. Uh, I'll probably come in after that for some questions if there are any questions. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, there we go. Thank you for muting your microphone. Thank you, Feline, for also muting. Um, I see a couple of questions here. I just want to acknowledge them. Um, there's a question in the Q&A, Matt Mercer asked, but I think, um, I think Gemma answered that question for us. Uh, are there any other, other questions? No, there was a suggestion or a request from... Um, um, where is he now? Ricardo, yes, asking, you know, if we can uh, tweak one or two of the, the experiences that we currently have on the website. And I do have a response for you, but I think let me bring Feline into this conversation so that she can share specific sets of information with you in your specific areas. Um, Feline, how are you doing? I am doing extremely well. Thank you, Tracy. Um, and thank you for everybody that has dialed in today. Us Captonians don't only fancy our mountain, but we also love a good get together. And I'm always one saying at the actual events in our past lives, of course, that um, this always feels like a mini family reunion. Um, today, it will just have to be without the hugs um, and the wine. But uh, I do look forward to a time when we can once again engage on that level. However, for today, let's focus on the here and now and what 2020 brought us and brought us, taught us uh, from an from a industry perspective. So from private property, um, we believe obviously that the knowledge empowers and equips our property shoppers. Those are our consumers, the feet and the eyeballs coming to the site and your buyers to make the best property buying decisions that they possibly can. However, we also believe the same can be said in terms of you, the property professional. And for the purpose of today's presentation, I aim to give, like Tracy earlier mentioned, area specific information within the Cape Metro, obviously very aware of the time constraints we have. So I've tried to keep it to the point. And the point of course being that there's a very very targeted, large audience out there looking, searching, and most importantly, inquiring people with property needs that you obviously need to attend to. So for the purpose of today, I've taken the Cape Metro, and there's the mountain again, so greatly. Um, uh, it differs, obviously, from, from area to area. So what I've done is I've broken the information down into the following areas stipulated there the Atlantic Seaboard and Cape Town City Bowl. 
Then I've taken, uh, secondly, the Cape Flat and Matruasfontein. Thirdly, the northern suburbs, or more affectionately known as the Budaborschortein to us here in Cape Town. The western seaboard, the peninsula, also known as False Bay, and then obviously the southern suburbs. So um, I will try my utmost best not to bore you or to kill you by PowerPoint, as Jan says. However, I believe these statistics will definitely be relevant and interesting to you based on where you are sitting and where you've tuned in from today. So if we can go to the next slide, please, studio. Um, we are going to start with the Atlantic Seaboard and the Cape Town CBD and the performance we've seen um, over the last three years. So going up, I've literally um, split it up into sales and I've added the rental view in the same view here. So looking at the sales views, we can see that going into 2019, there was quite a significant increase in views and then a further 40% increase in views from a sales perspective. Lead wise, 12 and 6% into 2020. The rental views and leads, believe it or not, really is an interesting one here. 50% um, rental views, 33 for 2020. And then I really want you to pay attention here to what the rental leads did. 42% in 2019 and a 7% increase into 2020. So taking into in consideration what we've seen in the rental market and having been in the Nexus seminars over the past couple of days, and having prepared this presentation and listening to you hit earlier, I can say that this is quite a rare phenomenon at the moment. Rental leads increases are few and far between. So I am sure we can speculate a lot um, as to why the 7% increase, and I would love to hear your views. Moving on to the Cape Flats and Matruasfontein, I believe the slide to be very interesting, especially from a rental perspective once again. Um, also, when we get to the top 50 search suburbs a little later, you'll notice a similar trend in terms of activity when it comes to sales listings. And um, what I want to point out here is once again, you can see the significant growth in terms of sales views from year to year. And then the same, on the same side, the, uh, sorry, the sales leads, 44 and 24%. I had to go back and double check the rental views and the rental leads. Um, an increase from 2018 to 2019 of 157% and a further 16 and then 143% in terms of leads into 2019. Then there's a little back step and this is what I mentioned just now. Uh, definitely not going back into the um, 2018 level. But um, it makes me think of that saying that someone that have figured out taking a small step backwards after having taken a big step forward, it's not an absolute disaster, but rather we should think of it as a cha-cha. So I suppose this is um, our, our dance with COVID and the impact it's had on the rental industry at large. Um, moving on to the following suburb the northern suburbs, once again, you can see the increases there in terms of sales views, sales leads, and then the rental views, interestingly, also quite a significant jump, 97% into 2019 and a further 16 in terms of views, lots of eyeballs there. And then in terms of the leads generated, 88% increase and further back step again, there we go, 11%. Moving on to the Western Seaboard, I believe is next. Similar, very, very similar trends there. 51 and a further 54% in terms of sales views. So once again, lots of activity there. Sales leads also, definitely not to be frowned at. And then the sales, the rental views, I find it interesting. I've heard of a couple of people actually residing a little bit inland. Um, in Cape Town that during lockdown last year rented out spots on the beachfront due to um, competitive pricing just for that period of lockdown. It was quite interesting to see um, a little bit of uh, sea views being posted on the socials, but there it is, the back step again, 12% reduced in 2020 in terms of, um, of rental leads. The peninsula, 
very interesting. Again, um, traditionally a little bit quieter on the activity side, having gone up 30% in terms of 2019 and a further 50. Um, and then the rental leads, a smaller back step in terms of rental leads, just 5%. And then lastly, the southern suburbs, 37% um, increase in, in sales searches, 15 and a further 15 increase in sales leads into 2020. Um, rental views, similar trend, fantastic, 51% um, in rental views in 2019, 13%, and then a 41% gain in rental leads and there's the back step again 10 percent um, into 2020. right so moving on to the top search suburbs and my second last slide i find this really interesting and if you keep an eye on the data and you do regular comparisons um, it is interesting to see how these change and with Mitchell's Plain, very interestingly, at the very top of these results, with an average of 320 listings, sales listings, on offer and showcased in this area at any given time. So by looking at these suburbs versus the list of a year or two ago, it is our view that there is a new set of browsers coming to the site, a market looking for properties just below the 1 million mark, and most probably first time home buyers hungry for information and knowledge about how they can find their dream home. Um, and we also believe that that to be a, a mostly untapped market. And I almost want to say hashtag opportunity here. So there's lots of interesting entrants here. Instantia, Seapoint, Claremont, Camps Bay, also very high on the list. But then again, we wouldn't want to live close to the pristine and serene beaches of Cape Town not to mention our beautiful mountain. And then moving down the list, beautiful table view always. It's remained on the list forever. And this time bringing along its friend Parklands North to the Cool Kids Circle, and then um, Grassy Park and Artery Retreat also there. I also saw Dana Bai in there um, within the garden route. So yeah, when you drill into the areas, it also becomes quite interesting to see where the eyeballs are going. And then moving on to my very last slide about medium price. Before, I look, before we look at the data though, I'd like to remind you of two things. So firstly, what is a median price? So firstly, it is the very middle point of real estate prices. So it's not the same as an average though, importantly, the median price is the price in the very middle of a data set with exactly half of the houses priced for less and the other half priced for more. And then secondly, these are referring to listing prices. So obviously not the final selling price. Um, we don't have view of that just yet. But um, yeah, if we look at the data here with no surprises, the Western Cape on average about 30% higher than the national sales median and for rentals about 28% higher than what rental properties are at um, in, on a national level. I suppose everybody wants to live in Cape Town and they will pay for wanting to do so. So also interesting to note on the sales side, when looking at the median from last year, 2020 in February, comparing it to the last month, there's been a mere 3% drop in price compared to last month, uh, February 2021. From a rental perspective, though, we did notice a 9% decrease in the median from last year, February to this. And then having listened to what you had had to say, she gave great insights with regards to the drop here earlier in her presentation. Um, but I believe it's also due to some right sizing on the part of the landlord, um, apparently for prop especially in Cape Town where prices were, were quite high. Um, and that, folks, is really all I have for you today. However, I would really like to extend a very heartfelt invitation to all of you that would like to engage with us afterwards. My team and I would gladly set up meetings to answer any questions you have relevant to your particular area. Deirdre and Louise have joined us today. Unfortunately, Carrie Lee can't be here. 
Um, but yeah, I will put my details, my email address in the chat box. And we really look forward to hearing back from you. Um, yeah, thank you, Tracy. Back to you. Thank you so much, Feline. There we go. Just put me put me on mute on or put yourself on mute on your side. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, thank you so much, Feline. As you can see, this event is going to end in the next 14 minutes. And we've already had quite a number of uh, delegates drop off. I think that's due either to load shedding or to the fact that we tend to like meetings in a virtual environment, where in the past we may have had a, a bit of time to travel in between spaces. We now tend to virtually just, you know, literally give ourselves 10 minute, 10 minute break, run to the bathroom, get some coffee, and then bam, we're in the next one. So that uh, that is why we're losing. Well, that's why some some of the people have already dropped off. But I see that there are a few questions here. Yeah, I'm going to start with Ricardo's to Carl. Private property needs to allow multiple search searches at once, area searches at once when looking to buy in. He said Bloberg Strand, etc. It's tedious to do all those areas, and for people moving there they don't know that there is all those many areas within an area this is something that we already are looking at right carl and i see you switched your camera on that's the first question carl i want you to answer matt mercer will south africa ever have a portal owned by the industry such as realtor.com in the us what would be the advantage and advantages and disadvantages of such a portal and would be that trusted partner i hope so we definitely hope so. Maybe Carl, you, you you responded to that or answered that in your talk, but maybe just touch on that. And then the last thing I want you to tackle, Carl, or maybe Feline, you can tell us, is uh, is Hard Bay together with the Atlantic TV? It is for the purposes of today's presentation. It was yes. So Carl, please go. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the first bits of technology we're going to be having will solve that problem around being able to search for um, for uh, different suburbs. So what we do is we do user storage, right? So we go as a consumer, I am moving to Cape Town from Joburg. How do I know that Bloberg is here and Hype Bay is there? You just simply don't. So that's again us understanding the pain points of the consumer and using technology to do that. That's actually going to be one of the first bits of, of new tech that we're going to be bringing. So that's a double thumbs up that we'll be solving that in the next couple of months, uh, and as well as a whole host of, of other things, right? So we've obviously, we've been engaging with, with real estate pretty much our entire existence. So we, we understand really good starting points around what your pain points are. So our first couple of iterations on our new technology will be solving a lot of these pain points for consumers and for clients. Uh, the next one's probably a bit of a politically loaded question, but I'll, I'll take a stab at it in any case. Uh, private property uh, does have a minority shareholders um, of real estate. And we actually, with the EAPPC, actually opened it up um, beginning of this year, late last year, to other people. So there is a minority stake of, of ownership in private property through real estate. Uh, advantages and disadvantages, uh, pretty much what I was saying initially, right? How do you get that balance, right? So. What's, what clients want is not always the same as what consumers want. So if you wholly owned by real estate, it would be a difficult thing to try and manage. Whereas luckily with the way we position, we are in the center and we try and sort out for, for, for both things. But absolutely, there's obviously lots of pros on it um, that we, we've got great partners in all of us. But you don't need to be a shareholder to be a partner in private properties. I think really what we want it to be. We speak about us being humans, you being humans. We cherish the word partnership and we want to work together. We're not always going to agree, but we do want to work together. Thank you very much for a, a, a really good response to that politically charged question, Carl. Much appreciated. I'm going to release you both <laughs> from the from this. Have a wonderful rest of your day and thank you so much. I think that brings us completely to the end of our conversation here today. The Nexus for today that had its focus on the Cape Metro, Atlantic Seaboard, Northern and Southern Suburbs, and South Peninsula. Thank you so much for joining us today. I just have a few more things to share with you before I go. And that is that if you look at it, um, the, this chat here, Trish just popped in the link for you to be able to register for your one and a half 
non-verifiable CPD points courtesy of AISA. Click on that and then register for your points. Anita, I think we're gonna, this event is open for the next nine minutes and 49 seconds. I'm gonna ask that um, Trish reaches out to those individuals who need a little bit more um, assistance on how to get their points. Everyone, I wanna thank you so much for uh, being here today. Thank you so much to Apps and Payprop for sharing their knowledge and insights with us. We appreciate every single one of you in attendance today and trust that it's been of value. Why don't you drop me a little emoji to say thank you so much. Thank you, JP Ricketts, I see you. Gemma, thank you. Nicola, thank you. Thank you for the all those African proverbs and thank you for the good conversation. We are going to have these Nexus series again in the future and drop us a, a line if there's anything in particular you think we can tackle together in this format. For the rest of the day, I wish you a brilliant, brilliant day ahead. And um, remember, tomorrow is our final set of Nexus and we're going to be focusing on the Gauteng region. region so don't miss that. Thank you so much, Lynette. Thank you, Lynette Lambrechts. I see you there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sign off, but like I said, the event will be open for the next eight minutes. If you switch on your camera, you can greet your colleagues. Uh, if you switch on your mic, they will just be able to hear your voice. But thank you so much for your time. We really, really appreciate you. And this is me, Tracy Miller, signing off on behalf of the Nexus, Cape Town, Atlantic Seaboard, Northern Seaboard, Northern and Southern Suburbs, South Peninsula, in partnership with APSA. Thank you. Have a wonderful day.